In this lecture, we'll review some basic general concepts about measures. We won't give a complete review of measure theory. You're still expected to be familiar with things like integrals and dominated convergence theorem and so on. But our main goal is to fix some notation terminology and also to emphasize the concept of measurability and the problem that it poses when we want to study sets using measures later on. So first of all, in this class, we are going to be exclusively working in um, separable metric spaces. And most of the time, we're going to be working in Euclidean space. So whenever I write, um, whenever I write an x here, I'm usually going to mean a separable metric space. However, keep in mind that some of the notions I'm going to talk about generalize to uh, topological spaces. Uh, so in this class, we're going to define a measure on a metric space x uh, to be a set function, non-negative set function, satisfying the following properties. So first of all, uh, the measure of the empty set is zero. Second of all, the monotonicity property holds. So if I have set A contained in B, then the measure of A is at most the measure of B. And also, I have countable subadditivity. So if I have a countable collection of sets, then the measure of their union is at most the sum of the individual measures. So some familiar examples of measures are uh, Lebesgue measure on the real line. Um, a simpler example is the Dirac mass. So given the point x0, this is a measure whose mass is concentrated at the point x0 in the sense that the measure of a set A is 1 if and only if that set contains x0, otherwise it's 0. And another simple example of a measure is just counting measure. So this just counts the number of elements inside a set A. Now, you might be scratching your head a bit and thinking, wait, aren't these measures supposed to be additive and aren't they defined on a sigma algebra of sets? So yeah, we'll get to measurable sets and etc. later on. And yes, that is uh, uh, usually how it's covered in you know, first year measure theory classes. What we're describing might be better described as an outer measure. However, since we're going to be dealing with outer measures so frequently, uh, it'll be easier for us to just refer to them as measures. And this is the, the terminology that Matala uses in his book, Geometry of Sets and Measures in Euclidean Space. Moreover, if we're given a measure that is only defined on a sigma algebra of sets, we can also extend it to a measure in using our definition, um, or a measure according to our definition by using um, this uh, extension, and I'll leave it as an exercise to, for you to verify that this is the case. Now, the definition of a measure is shaped around our intuition of how mass is supposed to behave. So for example, uh, monotonicity is motivated by the idea that if we have a set A and we add stuff onto it, then its mass should only increase, not decrease. And if a subadditivity says if we take uh, a bunch of sets and combine them together, then the total mass should be no more than the sum of the individual masses. Okay. Now, one intuitive notion of mass that we didn't include and happens to break down for even very simple measures is additivity. So that is to say, this is the idea that the mass of a union of disjoint sets should be equal to the sum of their individual masses. So uh, as an example, so consider three-dimensional Lebesgue measures. So I'll denote that by curly L3. So this is the unique extension of volume in the sense that it is the unique measure defined for all sets in Euclidean space so that whenever I plug in a cube, I get the volume of that cube back. Okay, so one might think that for such a fundamental measure, um, this measure should be additive. And it is for very simple disjoint sets like balls and cubes. But once we move away from balls and cubes to more uh, general sets, uh, more complicated sets, additivity breaks down. And a very over-the-top counterexample is using the Bonnock-Tarski paradox. So a consequence of this paradox is the following. So suppose I have a set A that, let's say this set is the unit ball in R3. Then I can divide this set into finitely many pieces. And then for each one of these pieces, I can you know, rotate it and translate it in some way so that I get two identical unit balls back. Okay, So uh, this implies that Lebesgue measure can't be additive. So because otherwise, if it were, then each one of these individual pieces, the 
Lebesgue measure, or the volume of these individual pieces, shouldn't change under a translation of rotation. Okay, so that means that if additivity were true, then the measure of A should be equal to the sum of each one of these individual pieces, and then that should equal to the measures of their translations and rotations, which should equal the measure of two balls. And now the measure is double. Uh, one important point is that the Bonnach-Tarski paradox is a consequence of the axiom of choice. Okay, so and in fact, all counterexamples, uh, all examples of like non-measurable sets, and all examples of where measures are not additive, depend on the axiom of choice. So thus, if if we're going to assume the axiom of choice or accept the axiom of choice, uh, Lebesgue measure can't be additive. But clearly, Lebesgue measure is additive for some very simple kinds of sets. Like if I didn't split this into weird axiom of choice sets, if I just split it in half, then clearly uh, the measure of the ball is equal to the sum of the halves. So we need a way of distinguishing or classifying sets that behave well with respect to measure in the sense of additivity. And this leads us to the notion of measurability. So specifically, we're going to say that a set A is mu measurable if the measure of any other set, E, is equal to the sum of the measure of the part of it in A and the part of it that's not in A. So given this definition, the set of measurable sets uh, ends up being a sigma algebra. So what this means is that, uh, so first of all, the empty set and the whole space are inside my set of measurable sets. Uh, whenever I have a set in my sigma algebra, its complement is inside my sigma algebra. And moreover, countable unions and countable intersections of sets in my sigma algebra remain in my sigma algebra. So basically, sigma algebras are a collection of sets that are preserved whenever I uh, take any kind of reasonable combination or operations of sets. Now, if we restrict our measure to these measurable sets, then our measure is more nicely behaved. So uh, first thing to observe before I talk about these properties is that if the measure of a set is equal to zero, then it is automatically measurable. So if I have a countable list of sets, uh, measurable sets, then if they are disjoint, then I have the additivity, additivity property. The measure of the union is equal to the sum of the individual measures. I also have the following continuity properties. If I have a sequence of an increasing sequence of sets, then the measure of then the limit of the measures is equal to the measure of the limit, where uh, the limit in this case is equal to the union of the sets. And similarly, if I have a decreasing sequence of sets, then the limit of the measures is equal to the measure of the limiting set, which is just the intersection. So this is all standard so far from first year measure theory. The point is to take home is that while our measures will be defined for all sets, they behave nicely and in a more intuitive fashion on the smaller collection of measurable sets. Now, when a measure is defined on a topological space, there's an important uh, concept called the support of the measure. So this is defined to be the, close, uh, the smallest closed set whose complement has measure zero. Um, now, again, we're primarily going to be working in several separable metric spaces. So this definition is actually equivalent to uh, the set of points where the measure of any ball centered at that point has positive measure. OK, so the support uh, heuristically is just supposed to tell you where the function exists and where it where it's concentrated. So let's go over a few examples. So if I have a function f, a Lebesgue measurable function, I take it times Lebesgue measure, then the support of this measure is equal to the closure of the places where it's not zero. If I have a Dirac mass center at x naught, then it's not too hard to show that the um, support of the Dirac mass is just the point x naught. So notice that by definition, every ball center at x naught has positive measure. For every point not equal to x naught, I can find a ball disjoint from x naught centered at that point, and that ball will have measure zero, according to the definition of Dirac mass. Now, a confusing point about the support is that sometimes it doesn't coincide with our intuition for how like the support should behave. So consider the following measure. So I take a combination of Dirac masses centered at the rational numbers. So you would think that, okay, the support should just be the union of the individual supports, which is the rationals. But remember that the support is supposed to be the smallest closed set whose complement is uh, measure zero. And in this case, 
the support is actually going to be the whole real line. Okay, so why do we use closure? Uh, why do we use closures? Why do we use this definition? So the reason that this is natural to work with is that typically in applications, we're more concerned with how measures interact with open sets and specifically open balls. So really we're concerned with the set of points where all balls will be positive. And so this is sort of a natural uh, definition of the support of a measure from that point of view. One last bit of notation I'm going to recall is the restriction measure. So given a subset of metric space, the restriction of a mu to a set is just the measure defined by uh, as follows. The measure of a set E is just the measure of A intersected with E. Uh, so it's not too hard to show that measurable sets are preserved under restriction. So that is to say, um, if I have a measurable set for U, uh, for mu, then it's also a measurable set for mu restricted to A. So on this last slide, I just want to list some other concept that I'm not going to go into detail about, but you should review since we'll be using all these concepts throughout the course. So in the next video, we're going to start focusing on a much smaller class of measures, the Borel and Radon measures.